Over the last 80 years, almost every Christian-majority country that became rich has also become less religious. But there is one major exception, the United States of America. Religion is so omnipresent in the USA that even if you've never gone there, you probably know about mega churches, politicians always mentioning God, or getting angry about people who say Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas. So how did they get here? Why is the USA so Christian? Chapter 1. Make America Woke The USA started out as a British colony and as a result the USA got their early Christianity from Great Britain. And in the 1730s and 1740s, Great Britain had something called the First Great Awakening. This was a period where Christian preachers started saying that if you wanted to be a good Christian, you had to try to be as much like Jesus as possible. Because according to them, Jesus was the son of God, but also human. Therefore, Jesus is the perfect human. And if you are human, you should try to be as perfect as possible. And to British Christians at the time, that meant you had to be as much like Jesus as possible. It wasn't good enough to just believe in God or just go to church or just be baptized. Only if you devote your life to becoming the perfect human would you be allowed into heaven. At the same time in the American colonies, people stopped going to church. They would still consider themselves Christian, but stopped attending church sermons. And these churches had to find a new way to get people to come back to the church. They looked at Great Britain's first awakening and saw opportunity. You convince people that in order to go to heaven, you need to be a good person. To be a good person, you need to be like Jesus. And to be like Jesus, you need to go to church regularly to learn about him. And because humans are flawed creatures, no person will ever become perfect. So people will have to keep attending church for the rest of their lives. Take their children to church and shame other Christians for not being real Christians if they don't attend church often enough. This was called Puritanical Christianity and it was a fantastic marketing strategy because more and more people in the British colonies started going to church again. It didn't matter whether you were Baptist, Protestant, Roman Catholic or anything else, as long as you were Puritanical. Some of the British colonies in the Americas became religious colonies, where people who believed in certain versions of Christianity would come together to try to create a paradise for Christians to practice their faith. New England England, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Maryland were established as such religious colonies. And religion became an important part of keeping the colonies united. Because if you want to create a new colony, you need to bind these people together somehow. You need to have some reason why people will stay with your colony instead of going somewhere else. And the best way to bind people together is hatred. People who hate the same values are more likely to want to stay together. And these colonies hated one thing above all else. People who did not try to live up to the example of Jesus Christ. So basically, they hated the whole world except themselves. And when you hate the whole world, you start to think you are special. After all, if you believe that the whole world is wrong, but you are right, then you must be a very special person for realizing what you think is the truth. And according to these puritanical Christians, they did indeed have proof they were right. Because they believed that if you are a good Christian, then God will answer your prayers. Some of these people did indeed claim that they had visions, or that God gave them what they asked for in a prayer. And this is in a time where communities were small and everybody knew everybody in town. So you personally would know whoever claimed to have had a vision of the Christian God. And you are a lot more likely to believe people whom you have a personal connection with. So according to the puritanical Christians, they had evidence that everything they believed was right. That they had proof that they weren't crazy, but that the rest of the world was crazy for not being puritanical. After all, there was nobody there with an understanding of psychology, psychedelics or neurology that could prove it wasn't God doing it. And this put pressure on other people who did not have visions and who did not feel that their prayers were being answered. And this is where a funny thing in psychology happens. Everybody around you is achieving success, such as getting closer to God. You don't want other people to think you're a bad Christian. So people overcompensate for this fear and will actively show other people that they are not bad Christians. 
To make this easier to understand, I will give a modern example. A lot of children are taught that being gay is bad. Some of these children become teenagers who find out that they themselves are gay. These people often bury their homosexual feelings and will try to live the heterosexual lifestyle their parents told them to live. When this person is confronted with their own buried feelings, they lash out. So if, for example, this person sees a gay person who lives a happy life with their partner, then this person might lash out. They do this because they are afraid that if someone finds out they are gay too, then their life will be ruined, at least according to them. Some of them even go so far as to publicly speak out against homosexuality or even pass laws against these people. If you think I'm exaggerating, I would like to turn your attention to Joseph Sayer. He is the person who created homophobic laws in Hungary. And in 2020, the Belgian police caught him sneaking out of an illegal gay sex party in Brussels during the lockdowns. And this exact same process was happening in the colonies. They believed that their religion was the true religion. Then people claimed to get visions from God and they were validated in their belief. People who felt that they weren't living up to the ideals of Jesus Christ became radicalized as a means to compensate for their own lack of self-worth. And so they would also claim to have had their prayers answered. This just made more people convinced that puritanical Christianity was the correct faith to have. And these people created an identity for themselves as being special, because they are the only ones whom God will speak to. Therefore, these colonies must be special places blessed by God. A theme that is still present in the USA today. God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. And the colonies had a clear enemy, everybody who wasn't puritanical Christian, therefore keeping the highly religious colonies united. And for decades, this strong sense of being a Christian people spread across the British colonies that are now the USA. And over the decades, as this puritanical Christianity began to spread, it also began to change. And these Puritans, as they were called, sought new ways of being a good Christian, and they turned towards conversion. Chapter 2 Missionary Style According to Christian mythology, when a person dies, their soul leaves their body and goes to either heaven or hell. If you're a good Christian, you go to heaven. If you're a bad Christian, you go to hell. And your soul will spend millions upon billions upon trillions of years in either of these two places. But how can a person be a good Christian if they don't know Christianity exists? The answer, according to the colonists, was to convert them to Christianity. This will prevent their soul from having to spend eternity in hell. And the puritanical Christians began to believe that preventing people's souls from going to hell was one of the greatest things a person can do. And so puritanical Christianity started converting others into their religion. But who do you convert? Well, right next to the colonies were Native Americans. And these Native Americans were a problem to the rulers of the colonies, because they lived on fertile land that the colonies wanted for themselves. But how do you take other people's land from them? The religious and political leaders argued that they had to spread Christianity in order to save other people's souls. And so the colonies expanded their territory often starting with missionaries setting up places of worship followed by colonies settling the lands. The Native Americans were then either wiped out, integrated or driven off their land. The colonies would then send farmers to work the fields and make money. As their population increased, they wanted new territory. And so they started the process all over again in the next territory, once again beginning with missionaries. Christianity became a tool used by politicians to expand their territory, while politics became a tool used by religious leaders to expand their Christianity. And this was justified in the belief that these British colonies were a special group of people, that they were the only ones who truly understood what it meant to be a good Christian, and that therefore they were chosen by God, and God is the ultimate good. And if the colonies are fighting for God, then they must ultimately be good as well. And if the colonies are fighting for ultimate good, then whoever stands in their way must be evil. 
and this is where the USA created an image of itself being the ultimate good guys fighting for a good cause, while whoever stands against them are bad guys fighting for an evil cause. Be it Native Americans, European empires, the Japanese, communists, Muslims, or now the Chinese. It's always the same story. When US politicians get into a conflict with other people, they tell everybody that the USA are the good guys fighting for good values that everybody wants, while their enemies are evil people fighting for evil values that nobody wants. Chapter 3 Making America Woke Again Facts don't care about your feelings, but the church did care about your feelings. The first Great Awakening was followed by a second Great Awakening, after the USA became an independent country, starting in the 1790s and ending in the 1840s. During the Second Great Awakening, people's feelings about religion became more important than the facts about religion. Before this, in the 18th century, Western societies would debate religion using facts and logic. Because, thanks to the First Great Awakening, it was more important to be a good Christian rather than which specific church you went to. This meant that all churches were competing with each other for followers, while at the same time, all churches looked kind of the same. So what if, for example, a church decides to be very different from the other churches? This would give that one church a unique selling point, a reason to go to that church and not to another one. I have a degree in marketing. And you know what sells better than facts and logic? Feelings. If you can make a person feel good about buying or using your product, then they will keep coming back. And in the case of the church, this meant making people feel good about going to religion. But how do you make people feel good about your sermons? Well, they tried to bring emotional and supernatural elements into their sermons by talking about something called the second coming. According to Christian mythology, Jesus is the Son of God who eventually went to heaven. One day, he will come back to earth to punish everybody who wasn't a good Christian and create a thousand years of peace and happiness here on earth. And according to a lot of people living in the 19th century, the second coming was indeed coming. And to a society which idolizes Jesus, this is a very powerful and emotional message. And when one person became emotional, it was the goal to make everyone else feel similar emotions. To feel good about their religion, about the second coming, and about going to church. Maybe you've ever gone to a church where they had a band, some nice snacks, and a get-together at the end where you can all hang out. This is basically the same strategy. Make people feel good about going to church, and they will keep coming back. These tactics were particularly effective against women and young people. Young people tend to resist the ideologies of their parents and emotion-based churches were a way for them to show this resistance. While most women at the time had children, and if a woman was converted to a religion, she would often take her children with them. And then those children would likely grow up to go to that same church as well. And these churches that made people feel better about themselves got more followers. So other churches tried to do the same, or else they would lose their followers too. For about 50 years, churches became more and more emotional in the USA, always trying to make their flock feel better than another church's flock. Chapter 4 Every Problem A Religious Solution in the 19th century, the United States of America colonized from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast of North America. There were no new places left to conquer, and all those frontier towns became cities, and their small churches became large churches. Instead of dozens or hundreds of people, they would now have thousands of people attending the church. And as more and more people moved to the cities, they needed somewhere to connect with new people. And a lot of them did that through the church. And when you have a large group of people living closely together, they will start to realize there are a lot more of them than there are of the people in power. And so they start to fight for social issues. Women's rights, the right to vote, abolishing slavery, and many, many other issues were discussed in the church. And those churches began taking political standpoints. And if you agreed with the politics of a certain church, you were more likely to join that church. And so you had a lot of like-minded people attending church together on a weekly basis. And these people created social movements. 
If you believe that women should or should not have the right to an abortion, then there was a church out there where people were fighting for either cause. If you believe the person should or should not drink alcohol, then there was a church fighting for prohibition. And if you thought slavery was either good or bad, then there was a church out there to fight for the cause you believed in. For example, in 1816, a man named Richard Allen was praying in a church. The other people didn't like an African-American in their church, so they lifted him up off the ground and threw him out. His solution to this problem was to create the African Methodist Episcopal, a church made by African-Americans for African-Americans. Religion was never the main reason why people were fighting for social issues. But because churches provided people with the ability to fight for social issues, those social issues also became religious issues. And pastors, priests and bishops began speaking out about social issues in their sermons. And of course, they did so through religious language. The right to end a pregnancy was considered murder and therefore considered a religious issue. Alcohol was so religious, it was served at sermons. Both slavery and freedom Freedom were condoned by the Bible. Religion was already a tool used by politicians, but it now also became a tool used by activists. When slavery was abolished for non-criminals in the USA, those African Americans moved to the cities. But they had no money, no education, and no useful skills. At the same time, the USA was a racist society, which often didn't allow minorities to attend the same school as the majority. And so they found refuge in churches. Here they met fellow African Americans whose family had been freed decades or centuries earlier. And because of this, they had skills that other people wanted to learn. And in the church, they created all sorts of social programs. They created religious schools for children to get a proper education, job programs, training courses, insurance schemes, libraries, sports clubs and much more. And these churches were so well organized that some of them started fighting for their rights inside society as a whole. For example, the US Civil Rights Movement fought for equal rights between different ethnic groups in the USA through non-violent protests. It was organized by a couple of African-American churches under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And in their fight for equality, they often talked about religion. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. By the 20th century, Christianity had become so common in the USA that the only way of getting equality was through religious language. And we still see this today from immigration to LGBTQ plus rights to education. Religion is constantly brought up to either fight for or against these issues. Chapter 5 A Real Enemy the United States has had some form of a great enemy it needed to fight ever since the 18th century. At first it was the Native Americans whose land they wanted, then European empires who needed to be driven out of the Americas, then it was Japan and Germany who declared war on the US, but there was always one major problem with these enemies. They were far weaker than the USA. Native Americans lacked industry, European empires were too spread out to invade the USA, and Japan and Germany's economies were much smaller than the US. But then the Cold War happened. For the first time in US history, they had a real enemy. The Soviet Union. The USSR had a large economy. It had the ability to create nuclear bombs and its communist ideology was in opposition to US capitalism. The Soviet Union was the first country since independence that could destroy the United States of America with nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union was quite simply the perfect enemy for a country that constantly needed an enemy to fight against. Because the Soviet Union had state atheism which meant that the Soviet government would try to end religion within their country. While the USA was a highly religious country, and it went deeper than that. The Soviet Union was a dictatorship, the USA a democracy. The Soviets had a command economy, and the USA a capitalist economy. The Soviets liked red, the USA liked blue. 
all of a sudden, these old ideas that the USA was a special country chosen by God to become the savior of the world seem to actually be happening now. Dozens of countries were coming to the USA for protection. They agreed that the Soviet Union was a major threat and the USA assumed its position as the leader of most Western countries. And all these countries were afraid of a communist revolution. By 1945, they had happened in France, Ireland, Germany, China, Spain and Malaysia. All of them were capitalists at the time and all of them had to fight communists to keep it that way. So the US government wanted to prevent the communists from destroying the country from the outside and prevent communists from taking over the country from the inside. And in order to prevent internal threats, you need to make your population loyal to the government. But how do you do this? Well, one of the ways they did that was by portraying the USA as a Christian country that loved freedom, while portraying the Soviet Union as an atheist country that loved oppression. They made people afraid that if communists were to invade or take over the USA, that they would take people's freedoms away. And one of the most important freedom they would take away was the freedom to be Christian. In this worldview, the USA portrayed itself as Christian crusaders fighting to protect a Western Christian lifestyle against a whole of godless Soviets coming to destroy the American way of life. This started almost immediately after World War II was over with US President Truman praying to the nation. We thank God that he has come to us instead of our enemies. And we pray that he may guide us to use the bomb in his ways for his purposes. At the same time, the US government reached out to the Roman Catholic and Jewish organizations to form a religious alliance against communism. In it, the US would get support from religious institutions to spread anti-communist messages, while religious organizations got political support from the government. The next president, called Eisenhower, talked even more about religion. We hold that all men are endowed by their creator, not by the accident of their birth, not by the color of their skins or by anything else. All men are endowed by their creator. In other words, our form of government has no sense unless it is founded in a deeply felt religious faith. And I don't care what it is. With us, of course, it is the Judeo-Christian concept. And this basically sums up how the USA saw itself in the Cold War as a Christian capitalist nation that loves freedom, fighting an atheist communist nation that loves gulags. So if you wanted to be a true American, you had to love freedom, you had to love capitalism, and most importantly, you had to love Christianity. And in the years immediately following World War II, if you were an atheist, then you could be branded a traitor just for not being a good Christian, because only a good Christian could be a good American. And whether this idea is correct or not wasn't relevant. Once again, I studied marketing, and in marketing, feelings don't care about your logic. If the message makes you feel good, you will likely support that message. And to a lot of people, the idea that the USA was a special country chosen by God to become the savior of the world was very appealing. And those who found this message appealing would support the USA in their foreign wars, toppling foreign governments, or fight communism around the world. And so Christianity became a sort of marketing tool used by the government to portray a good self-image of themselves in order to keep the US population in favor of whatever the US government was doing outside of its borders. So to recap, the USA convinces its people there is a great evil they need to fight, such as the Soviet Union. For the first time, the USA faced a real threat instead of a small threat like Native Americans. The government then points at things that the USA considers evil, such as the USSR's atheism. It then portrays itself as a Christian nation. Therefore, the USSR isn't just a danger to the world, it is a danger to a person's way of life. Because from this point of view, the Soviets wanted to take people's religion away. And so the US government keeps using more and more religious content to portray the USA as Christian. So nobody would doubt that the USA is a Christian country. Presidents ended their speeches with God bless America. Children had to pledge their allegiance to their country every day in school with the phrase one nation under God. And the text in God we trust was printed on US dollars. The US population generally believed that they were a special country chosen by God to become the savior of the world. By the end of the 1950s, Christianity was everywhere in the USA. It became impossible for most people to go through a normal day without encountering Christianity at some point. 
Chapter 6 The Decentralization of Christianity In the 1960s, the baby boomers became adult boomers. And when a person becomes an adult, they start questioning the world around them. In particular, they start to question the ideas of their parents. Such as the idea that minorities had fewer rights. The idea that women had fewer rights. Or the idea that homosexuality is a sin. And these ideas were supported by mainstream churches, from Protestant to Baptist to Roman Catholic. But what if you are a minority, a woman, or an LGBT person? Why would you go to a church that says that who you are is a sin? To quote my favorite comedian, the church teaches that homosexuality is unnatural. Just like walking on water or rising from the dead after three days. So then, why doesn't the church conclude that homosexuality is also a miracle? And what about all those priests and their little boys? In case you don't know, children who attend Christian organizations like schools or churches sometimes get abused. When the church finds out about the abuse, that person is relocated to another church in another country. That way, by the time the children become adults and go to the police, the abuser has already left the country and can't get arrested anymore. While at the same time, the Bible teaches, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The first record we have of this happening is from 1051, almost 1,000 years ago. The church has known for almost 1,000 years and has done almost nothing about it. And while this type of abuse happens more often in the Catholic Church, the other major Christian denominations also have reports of this type of abuse in their churches. So even if you agree with the politics of these churches, you might still want to leave because of the abuse within them. As Christian organizations became more controversial, their politics less desirable, and their teachings outdated, people began to leave the church. Both regular people left, as well as priests, pastors, and bishops. After 1957, the people attending churches went down, even though the percentage of people considering themselves religious has remained stable until the 21st century. You may have heard the phrase, I love God, but I hate the church, or some variation of this. And this right here is when that started to become a thing. Slowly, over the course of decades, fewer and fewer people began attending church while still considering themselves Christian. They began practicing their religion in private, in small groups or New Age spiritualism. This makes the USA unique because every other Western Christian country has seen the amount of religious people slowly decline. Look at this map of religiosity in Europe for example. Atheists and agnostics are in the majority in several Western European countries, while in the USA only 12% of people are atheist or agnostic. But just because you leave the church doesn't mean you also want to leave Christianity. And those clergymen who left mainstream churches began founding their own churches. And those people who left mainstream churches began going to all of these new churches. But because there are so many of them, they had to compete with each other. And they found all sorts of new ways to attract new people by trying to be charismatic. From a marketing perspective, these newer, smaller churches could focus on specific groups of Christians and cater only to them. They would not get millions of followers like Protestants, for example, but because they were so small, they didn't have to. In the 1970s and 80s, churches began including bands in their sermons with Christian music. The first truly successful Christian music came from a band called Birds, with their album Sweethearts of the Rodeo in 1968. This album wasn't overtly Christian, but others soon started copying them and focusing on religious messages. It became standard for US music to mention Jesus, the devil, and heaven and hell. And also things like Christian rock were invented as a means to attract new people. Some of them were so successful that they created something new called megachurches, which are churches with at least 2,000 people attending sermons every week. And because those megachurches were so big, they had more money. And with more money, they hired professionals to create more attractive sermons, to lobby governments, or to launch protests. Preachers began appearing everywhere. You saw their face on the TV screen coming at you every Sunday. They had their face on the billboard, on the cover of the magazine. Christianity was already present in politics and social issues, 
but it was now everywhere. Christian music, Christian movies, Christian TV, Christian messages on the money, Christian politics, Christian everything. However, to a lot of people, this commercialization of Christianity was considered unchristian. According to the Bible, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. People who felt like this became unhappy with their own churches and tried to find new ways of experiencing Christianity. One way was the hippie movement, where people came together to experience Christian spirituality through new communities and chemicals. Another one was the Jesus movement, which provided only a strong community. People who joined these movements were generally unhappy with their life. They had tried to achieve success, but instead had found only failure. In their despair, they turned to religion and found a new community there to spend time with. All of a sudden, they had people who wanted to be their friends, who wanted to help them and gave them a purpose in life. Those people you sometimes see who seem very, very happy in their religion, unnaturally happy, like almost creepy, well, they are often part of this group of people, whose despair was ended through religion. And if religion helped you get over your major psychological issues, then it's easy to understand why they are so happy and zealous about Christianity. And when the hippie and Jesus movement stopped being popular in the 1980s and 90s, these people created even more churches on top of the ones that already existed. And today, Christianity is a highly decentralized religion in the USA, with only 47% following mainstream religions such as Protestantism or Catholicism. But it seems that in the 21st century, religion will decline in the USA. Over a third of people born in the 2000s identify as atheist or agnostic. It appears for now that the USA is going in the same direction that most other Western countries have. A generation of people who go to church less and less than their children don't go to church at all, and grow up irreligious. And with each generation, fewer and fewer people follow religion. But whether this trend will continue into the 21st century is up for debate. And most of us probably won't even be alive anymore if it does happen. And this is how the USA has become so Christian. If you like this video, then please give it a like and subscribe for more content. Thank you. Good night. And God bless America.